Welcome on in golf fans, it's your boy GS Luke here with our course breakdown for this week's PGA Championship. Gonna go through the Valhalla Golf Club, everything you need to know about this venue to go out there, place some bets, enter some DFS lineups, a little course details, hole by hole breakdown of the golf course this week, and then towards the end, some of my key stats and custom modeling for Valhalla that I'll be using to identify some of those top plays. So a lot to get into here, a golf course we haven't seen since 2014. So let's refresh ourselves a little bit of what to expect and get this thing rocking. Valhalla has had quite a restoration since the last time we've played there and added on even more length than what we had in 2014. And if you take a look at that leaderboard from there 10 years ago, there was already an emphasis on driving distance. So first off, par 71, but over 7,600 yards. So we've had a few longer par 71s lately. This one is even more beefy than what we had for those last few events. It's a Jack Nicholas design designed back in 1986, but as mentioned, has undergone quite a few restorations since then. So it's a little bit different here for 2024 than what we had for the last major, but in all accounts is a major championship type of test. They've got some long rough out there. You'll see a tall fescue bluegrass mix with the main set of rough being four inches long. Now it's worth noting that a lot of the other areas are not bluegrass. They are fescue, more of that hay, like you'll see in a European golf course. And that can be upwards of an entire foot long. So the main sort of rough is four inches. It's gnarly. That's going to be tough to hack out of. Kind of similar to what we had at Oak Hill for last year's PGA Championship. But the rest of the rough, right, that tall fescue that you see mentioned here is much more gnarly and really is lost ball central. So that is the more worrisome part. That is about 20, 25 yards off of every single fairway you either get a creek a natural area that's real gnarly or this tall fescue that'll gobble up your golf ball so on top of already being a long golf course there's also quite a penalty for missing it far offline off the tee so if you can keep it within reason right just missing that primary rough it's not going to be as much of a problem but as you'll see from the hole by hole breakdown a lot of the natural areas and tall fescue are well within play a few other notes we have bent grass greens this week so it'll be a t1 bent grass um, in terms of the agronomy there. Everything else is zoysia, so your fairways, approaches, all of that are going to be a Zeon zoysia grass, which is a little bit softer, and that combined with some rain expected on Tuesday, Wednesday, is going to make this golf course play even longer than what it did before. So it's long from the scorecard yardage, obviously some penalty off the tee, further adds emphasis there. And then when you have zoysia that's not going to run out all that much, you're dealing with what is going to be an extremely long and difficult golf course. So the agronomy bent grass, a little bit of a change with the zoysia out there on the fairways. But this rough that's four inches long, we're going to have to see just how gnarly it gets by the time we get to Thursday. And I'm expecting it to be kind of like Oak Hill last year, where if you get into that stuff, unless you're a Bryson, Wyndham Clark, Rory McIlroy sort of player, you're probably going to have a hard time hitting the green out of that stuff. So it should be a really good test. I think the scoring average, something in the low, you know, maybe five to 10 under par range is probably what we're going to see. And especially if the weather cooperates, right, we only have 5,000 square foot greens. If it's firmer than what I'm expecting, right, I think some of the rain will soften up the golf course a bit. If we dodge some of that rain before lock, I mean, this golf course could play closer to even par in terms of a winning score. So I think it's a really good major championship type of test and uh, should lead to a lot of entertaining action over the weekend. So I know we haven't seen this course since 2014. So let's go ahead and just hop right on into a hole by hole breakdown and get an idea of what these players are going to face. This track is really demanding and there's not really a shot out here where you can go to sleep on it. So I think all that is evident on hole number one, a little dog leg from right to left. Now it's only 441 on the scorecard. So maybe not that intimidating, but still requires an accurate drive. What you got to shape it from right to left a little bit to go out there and hold the short stuff. If you miss to the inside of the dog leg, you're absolutely dead. So a lot of misses will be out here to the right. And, you know, you're good if you only miss 5, 10 yards offline. But if you miss in this hay to the right, and that's what this longer cut is that you can see in this overhead view, you might be having to re-tee with a lost ball. So it's kind of like those European courses where in between you get that buffer of really long grass. And if you miss really far to the left, and really it's only like 5, 10 yards that you have to miss over here. If you miss in the trees, it's a first year layup too, right? You've got this dense forest over here, um, which will pretty much force you to hit out sideways. This is where you see that penalty off the tee. And then around the greens, something that you'll notice here is that there are fairway areas around a lot of the greens, a lot of them in front of the surface to kind of let you play it up 
towards the front end of that green, right? If you're hitting out of the rough, right? If you got to hack out, they at least give you that option. They'll play it along the ground, but you get a lot of that gnarly rough to the side of every green and then usually over the green. Uh, for the most part, there's a few little fairway areas, but most of the time it's this long four inch rough. So the around the green shots, I think you're going to have to, you know, practice both those fairway shots, right? The tight lies that you get this time of year, but also some of those longer rough lies like we had at Oak Hill last year. So I think it's a little bit of a more balanced test. You're going to get both of those shots around the green. And uh, this is as easy as it's going to get, right? Like 440 is as short as it's going to get out here at Valhalla outside of one sub 400 yard par four. Um, this is as scorable as it gets. Hole two is not a par five, so it's listed as a par five. They'll end up playing this tee box as opposed to the back one that you see on here. Maybe even this one just across the cart path that you see on the overhead view here, but this will play as a par four. So your target off the tee will be more aggressive down the line here. And on this hole, you've got a creek to the left to worry about. All of this is lost ball right over there on the left side. And then if you miss to the other side of the dog leg, you're going to add a longer shot into the green and potentially bring this deep forest into play so this is another really tough hole obviously a converted par 5 is always going to be pretty tricky but especially when it's your second shot on the round and you could have something like 200 in you know 200 plus yards into the green Hole three is 205 yards. It's your first par three. Water really isn't in play here, but still a tricky long iron shot, particularly if they use a back left pin. Hole four is that short par four I was mentioning. You can't go for the green here unless you're an absolute psychopath, but I do think that some people, I was watching a breakdown of this golf course before that said that, believe it or not, the safest play off the tee is to take driver and to take it towards this little cutoff area in front. So I think that your bombers, right, might prove me wrong a little bit in hit the driver but realistically if I was playing this hole right I'd be hitting to this corner leaving myself a wedge in because unless it's super soft so maybe Thursday Friday right when it's going to be a little bit softer towards the beginning of the week maybe they bomb it up there because the chip shot is a little bit more doable but when it gets firm and fast out there right these shots unless it's a back right pin and you have a lot of room to that back right pin are going to be really tricky right a front pin impossible to get it close with that sort of like 40 yard shot even like a front left pin right that's just just over this rough line would be pretty much impossible for that kind of shot. So I think a lot of it will come down to pin location with hole number four, right? That decision off the tee. But if you were to take driver, just to show you, right, it's 292 to right here, right? So I know it's a 350 yard hole. The direct line is much shorter, right, than that 350. So it is at least a decision that guys are going to have to think through. Hole five is 456, dog leg from left to right. You got a lot of hay on this hole, right? So you got the hay to the right. You can see that over there. And then the old, all the way over here on the left. And this is only about a 50 yard corridor. So you have to be real precise here, right? If you miss within reason, one of these bunkers is not the worst place, right? Same thing at this primary rough on the right. And that's that four, four and a half inch rough. So it's no guarantee that you're gonna have a lie that dictates that you can get it up near the green, but at least you're not gonna have a lost ball like you might be potentially have to the left or the right and even if you can find your ball over in that stuff it's going to be a hard time just to get the ball back to the fairway if you're going out sideways and you'd have to hit pretty much a full wedge shot right to get it out of that sort of long stuff Hole six is 497, longer par four. It uh, plays even longer than its scorecard yardage uh, because you kind of have to lay back off the tee. Everyone's going to be taking either a three wood, maybe mini driver off the tee and trying to take something off of it. And it's going to leave you about 220 yards into the screen, which is large. It is one of the larger complexes, but still not an easy hole by any means. Seven is a par five. So this one's 600 yards. And uh, in my opinion, the most intriguing hole in this golf course. So you can see they have this marker down here over the right, but off the tee, you may see this little area to the left, right? And what you're gonna see a lot of people do, in fact, I would venture that unless it's some weird wind direction that almost everyone is gonna take this target, is to hit it over here to the left, right? Because you can hit it to the right, it's a little bit more wide open. You still have some nasty stuff to the right to worry about, which I think there's probably gonna be some build outs over there this time. So maybe you get TIO relief if you hit it over there to the right. But if you hit it over here to the left, this hole becomes extremely reachable. So if you do that, your tee shot goes over here, and then your second shot, of course, would be going for the green in two. And if you do that, it's aggressive off the tee, it's aggressive into the green, but it only plays 537. If you play it around the, around the lake, so over here to the right, 
and then you play it up near the bunkers for your second shot, it's nearly a 600-yard hole, so almost a for-sure three-shotter, unless you're one of the longest players on tour, then it's still a really tricky shot, right, with water down the left. If you go down the left side here, you got to be precise, right? You can't miss with your tee shot. You can't miss with your second shot either, but you're going to have a much better chance to make eagle, right? And you're almost for sure going to be up around the green in two. So I think that the more aggressive approach is going to be where your better drivers, your better players go for it. And uh, you're going to see doubles here. You're going to see uh, maybe even worse than a double at this sort of hole. Uh, I can almost assure you that someone will make like an eight or a 10 at hole number seven, but you're prob probably going to see a good amount of threes made at that hole too. Hole eight is 175. So par three, a little bit shorter than some of the other ones, but still, you know, real narrow green, certainly not easy by any means. Nine is 412. So it's a shorter par four, but still, you know, you can't sleep on these shorter par fours, particularly if they give you a tricky pin location. Hole 10 is 590, so it is another par 5, but like all of them on site, they all have quite a bit of length to them. So unless you're hitting the short stuff and you're a longer player, right, most players are going to take this as a three-shotter. Right? Even if you're a long player and you hit it in the rough, it's for sure going to be a layup. But even if you're, you know, an average length guy, 590, especially if it's into the wind, is it's just not reachable. So it's a, a birdie look for a lot of players, but not the kind of gimme birdie look that we have at other golf courses 11 is 209, so it's your next par 3. It's a little bit longer, right, than what we had with the previous one, and a pretty tricky hole. 12 is 458, a little bit of a forced layup here, so you'll see players, right, laying up to this spot, and then trying to go for it with something from 170 to maybe 180 yards into 12. 13 is 356, so another shorter par 4, but kind of like the other shorter par 4, right? I think the other one you might see people go for it. Here, there's no incentive, right? You've got this little creek. You definitely want a full wedge shot into this type of green. So it's not drivable like you'd expect with that first par 4, but still birdie look if you can go out there and hit a good wedge. 14 is 215, so your last par 3 is beefy. It's long. It's got a lot of protection from bunkers around the green. 15 is 435, so mid-length par 4, but you do have this penalty area down the right that you have to worry about a little bit, so tricky, especially to a right-hand pin location. 16 is 512, so extremely long par 4. Dog leg from left to right as well, so a little bit of shot shaping that's required there. 17, 471, you need a little bit of a draw shape here to fit this fairway, so tricky off the tee and just a long hole in general. And then finally, 18, a finishing par 5. It is the most reachable of all the par 5s, but still tricky because of the penalty area, which you've got it to the right side off the tee. Your second shot um, doesn't really have water in play. It's more so this rough in the middle, these uh, little hills and humps that you have in this rough area that can be difficult. So if you hit it in the fairway, right, it could be a three shot or you could try and go for it in two. I think your longer players, especially if you hit the fairway, are no problem going to give this a go with their second shot. But if you miss in the center area, like I said, it could be a little bit dicey. So it's not a guaranteed birdie look. I'd say your bombers for sure have an advantage there, but they have the advantage on almost every single hole out there. So a lot of this depends on pin location too. A lot of slope out here on this boomerang shaped green and depending on where they put it it could be a tricky up and down if you miss it the wrong spot and now that we've seen the golf course let's go through some of my key stats and how i'm modeling for valhalla so the first thing i want to look at this week guys is ball speed and kind of like we've had for the last few weeks on tour ball speed has been the name of the equation and at a major championship test it's even more so the case when we have four or five inch rough and given how long this course is right some of the demanding shots off the tee i think having that category is going to be huge right whether it's extracting yourself from the rough like you saw from bryson of course winning that U.S. Open at winged foot, or just in general hitting good tee shots and setting up those birdie looks. So number one in ball speed would be a Bryson. Of course, no surprise there, but Minwoo up there. Also, Wyndham Clark, Rory McIlroy, some of your higher ball speed players. Toasty at the bottom end of the field. Same thing with Goddard up. Get a huge boost there as well. But we know the longer players, right? We know the guys that are going to lead in ball speed. So no real surprises on this list. Just something to include out there in your modeling. 
Another key stat that Bet the Number was looking at, and by the way, guys, for all of your modeling this week, make sure to check out Bet the Number. They are a partner here on the channel. Use code GSLUKE at, uh, at checkout for a discount on any monthly or year long membership. It's $5 off any monthly membership that you get for using code GSLUKE, and $50 off any annual membership if you go out there and use that code. So make sure to check it out. And something that they're pointing out, their team over there works with golfers on a weekly basis. They go out there and help with their strategy. Is this 175 to 250 range where almost all the par fives come in of course the par three approach shots are all going to be from 175 plus and then though not all the par fours are from four you know 450 to 500 yards a good chunk of them are so a lot of your approach shots are going to come from this range so it's something that they were emphasizing out there in their modeling and uh something i think we should be looking at as well so 175 to 250 some of your leaders there would be john rom terrell Han, nikolai hoygaard all players that excel there you've got hideki Jordan Smith, Charlie Hoffman, all poppers in that range. Maybe a few guys up top that we want to look at, right? So, um, better players in general popping in that category would be a Scotty Scheffler, right? You could see he's somebody that's green in that category. Minwoo Lee, great to see that. Ludwig Aberg, Victor Hovland, Patrick Cantlay are all players that get a significant bump in that bucket. So that's worth looking at. Ball speed we already took a look at as well. Um, the greens this week are a pure bent grass, right? A T1 bent grass. So they didn't have it over there. I bet the number, but I added it to my personal model. So on there, players that putt well on bent grass, You've got Cameron Smith, Patrick, um, uh, Matt Fitzpatrick, I should say, out there playing particularly well, Max Homa. Um, you can see this top end of the list, but top tier players showing up. You got Patrick Reed, Terrell Hatton putting well there. Also, Ludwig Aberg tends to like this bent grass. You can go a little bit further down, see Cam Young, right? He's not always the most consistent putter, but is popping out there and bent. Wyndham Clark, of course. Um, we're used to seeing him kill it on every surface, though, so that's not so much a surprise. But Fleetwood, very consistent on bent grass. Tom Kim Brooks Kepka. So if you're looking for a, a repeat PGA champion, right, he uh, he tends to putt really, well, um, really well on bent grass. Uh, it's number seven in my modeling in general, so um, is always going to be worth a look there. It's something else I want to point out on here. We can look at normal approach stats. That's included in my modeling. Of course, Scotty rolls that. Uh, a few guys to point out, Corey Connors hitting the ball well on approach. Siwoo Kim, same thing. Um, Keegan Bradley, a little bit under the radar, also hitting the irons very well. Um, you can look at normal off the tee stuff, right? Again, I think it's a, a power course um, we already looked at ball speed but if you want to look at off the tee right i think that's fine too a few guys to point out mitchell toasty right first time we've seen them jordan spieth really hitting the ball ball off the tee everything else sucks though so uh, jordan spieth probably not the best play um all of those stats are things that you're going to be including in your model probably didn't have to tell you to look at off the tee and approach stats right that's pretty much a no-brainer to go out there and throw into it. What I really like here are the shots gained at hard majors. So things that I'm, I'm looking at that maybe others aren't looking at is I went out there, I filtered it by golf courses that are first off major championships that played to a hard scoring average. So if there was a open championship, for example, like we had at St. Andrews, right, I didn't include that because they got to like 20 under par right by the end of the week. I think we're going to have single digits under par win this golf tournament. So I went out there and tried to compare to other majors. And you can see the players that play the best here um, are guys that are ranking really high in my modeling. So you've got Scotty Shuffler up there. Cam Smith, surprisingly, really likes these harder majors. And he won at St. Andrews, right? And I'm, I took that out of the model, right? Out there for the hard majors. And he's still at the top of that list. So I think that tells you just how well he plays, right? When it's an all-around test. So you got to like that for Cam Smith. Tommy Fleetwood, of course, no major championships to his name, but plays these sort of tracks really well. McElroy there, DeChambeau. Right? I think a lot of people think of him as an easier course specialist, right? Being a bomber, but that's not the case, right? He won at winged foot. He, he's played really well at the PGA Championships. We've had at courses like Oak Hill, so potentially worth a look there. Xander, Brooks, you would expect to see on this list. Um, Victor, right? Not the best form. Did play well, actually, the last two rounds at the Wells Fargo. So maybe a little bit of momentum there, but plays well at these harder tracks. Same thing with Colin Morikawa, Terrell Hatton. So the guys that are a little bit more surprising here, maybe Minwoo, you wouldn't expect to see at the top of the list. Terrell Hatton, right? I know I was surprised when I saw that there. And then I suppose Tommy Fleetwood, right? I mean, Tommy Fleetwood's number three in the field when it comes to shots gained at these hard majors. He's gaining two and a half strokes to the field there. So that is mighty fine, impressive. Of course, Scotty, right, in, a known, in his own uh, entire ranking, his own entire uh, tier out there at four uh, shots gained per round. But two and a half for Tommy Ladd, I thought was pretty surprising as well. 
The other things to note would be green regulation percentage, right? You don't want to be offline all that often. The issue is, is that these include stats from alternate field events, right? It's highly skewed by small sample sizes. So you can see like Garnett Duffner are one and two, which of course, right? It's because of the events that those two players are playing. So I wish this was greens and regulation gain to the field, right? I wish we could take a look at it at a comparative basis, but still something that you can include for, you know, players that don't have as large a sample. So you can see Duffner Garnett up there, but for larger sample size guys, we've got Scheffler, of course, John Rom killing it in those two categories. Benny and Norn, right, players that we see quite often on the PGA Tour, so we know that their stats are reliable. Same thing with an Aaron Rye, Victor Perez. A lot of that is PGA Tour-based stats. You got Aberg popping there. Guys like Vincent Norman also getting a lot of PGA Tour credit there. They're all players that you might want to keep an eye on for this kind of week. Alrighty, guys, that is all I've got for this week's course preview. Before you're hopping out of here, go ahead, smash that like button, but also comment down below what you've got as your winning score. And if you go ahead, give me that correct winner. We'll go ahead, give you a free month of my Patreon page. So on there, of course, is where you can get all the stats, all the behind the scenes content that I'm posting for every single week. And I'll include course modeling my projections for DFS, any prop stuff that I'm entering there too. So make sure to check that out in the description of the video for the access to my Patreon. But for a chance to earn a free month of that, also go ahead and give me your winning score prediction. I'm looking forward to it. Should be an absolutely blast of a week. If I had to give you my take for the winning score, I'll go ahead and say 10 under par, but would love to hear your thoughts down there in the comments. And of course, best of luck out there with the rest of your exposure, whether it's for outright bets, DFS lineups, props, you guys name it. You can check out all that content on the Patreon page. We'll go out there, try and have ourselves a week as well. But best of luck for all that exposure yourselves. I'm looking forward to it. Subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of the content throughout the week, which will include a betting and DFS preview, dropping a little bit later on this evening, our weekly live stream Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, and the showdown and prop content for rounds two through four. So a lot dropping pretty much every single day of this week. We'll have some piece of content, so you won't want to miss any of that to come. I appreciate you guys. Like I said before, best of luck. I'll see you guys for that betting and DFS video a little bit later on this evening. <music>